taping oral history for Charles McKinley, 56th Armored Infantry Battalion. What company, sir? It was uh, A Company. A Company of the 56th right. Armored Infantry. Right. And I started out in a rifle squadron, but uh, one day the bugler quit, and I said, that sounds like an easy job. I'll take it. So I moved up to the headquarters squad and became the company bugler. Wow. Under Captain Drass. Yeah. Before you entered the Army, were you drafted or did you join up? No, well, I volunteered, but I was at the University of Illinois as a freshman. And, of course, they told me if I volunteered, I'd get to stay in college and finish my degree and then, then go into the Army. But that was in September of 43, I guess. And then uh, in October of 44, they changed their mind. Or I think maybe I'm even off on a year of that. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's what happened. Could be 42, and then into March of 43, I went in. Now, boot camp. Boot camp, Camp Grant, Illinois. Mm -hmm. Just a regular, nothing special, just learning to put on a uniform, learning to drill, learning to eat Army food, nothing special. Okay. Um, when did you uh, get assigned to or join the 12th Armored Division? Not until, well, we went to, after the training in Camp Grant, they sent us to Camp Wallace, Texas to be trained in artillery training, Coast Guard, I mean, coastal artillery. And uh, somewhere in there in the training, they, just, they put out opportunities for us college kids to go either into OCS or, or back to school, into ASTP. And I thought, boy, college education is a lot better than going to OCS. So I chose college. And uh, they sent me, along with a bunch of others, of course, to Texas College of Mines and Metallurgy in El Paso, Texas where we stayed for two, two and a half semesters, and then uh, all of a sudden they needed more infantrymen than they needed college kids. So they yanked us all out and put us on trains, and I and many of my, in fact, most all of my classmates ended up in Camp Parkley, Texas, hmm. which is Abilene. Yep. Now, any memories of Abilene during the war that stand out, or, or of camp life? Well, nothing particular of camp life. It was it was tough. It was uh, it was hot and it was uh, very hard work. I do recall that we all, and especially the college kids, were very proud of ourselves because we were able to earn the Mar infantryman's badge, which was for showing a lot of skills in combat, and for which we got five bucks a month more, which was important. And the town of Abilene was very friendly, very nice. We came in and did our best to do everything that we could on Saturdays and uh, get back to camp in our big vans, big trucks that drove us to and from the camp for going on leave. But that was uh, basically what I remember about Camp Barkley. So tell me about the crossing of the, 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 Atlantic, the Atlantic crossing going over okay. to England. I've gotten a lot of stories about that. Well, first of all, we hopped the train at Camp Barkley, and I, again, being a very smart kid, I chose to go on KP. So I got to ride back in the food cars, much more room than the guys had up in front, and I got to eat beautifully all the way across to Camp Shanks, New Jersey. And in Camp Shanks, uh, we were there long enough so that we got passes into New York, and I was Knowing I was about to go overseas to be shot at, I wanted a drink. The bars wouldn't serve me. I was too young. That, would, that hurt me, hurt me deeply. But anyway, we climbed onto the Empress of Australia, which was, as I recall, kind of a dirty boat. And they put us, packed us in there on the floor, on tables, and in hammocks. And they didn't allow us up on deck too often and a lot of the guys got sick, so the atmosphere in that ship was not too, not too nice. But uh, it took, I don't know, 11 days or 14 days to cross the English Channel, and nobody shot at us that I remember. But I did learn to play bridge, and I learned to play craps, and I learned to play poker. All, all at a cost, you understand. It cost me money. But that was a, uh, and they fed us twice a day, that's all. And the food was 
pretty poor. So we were very happy to get to England. Now, Tidworth Barracks and uh, equipping for the for journey across the channel. Tidworth, again, was very, very pleasant for me because I was a bugler. And I just had to get up every morning and blow the morning calls and, and then night, blow the night calls. The rest of the day I was pretty much free to do what I wanted. And even in there we got passes to go into town. And I'll never forget, I think the name of the place was the Merry Garden Ballroom, famous ballroom in, in, in England. And we all went there to dance and pick up girls. And in England they would let you drink, so I could have a few drinks there. But uh, it was very pleasant. And I, I remember a story, and I tell this story without with tongue in cheek, because I'm not sure, but uh, a couple of my buddies and I got to room in somebody's house. And uh, they were very kind and let us stay overnight at their home. And the next morning the house next door wasn't there. So the German buzz bombs were coming over, and we didn't pay much attention to that. But I'm going to tell that same story that happened to me in France. So one of the stories is a lie. I think it's probably the one in England, because in France it probably did happen. Wow. Okay. Embarkation and getting over the, the Channel to France. How did you find uh, the French civilians, the French people? <laughs> well, we uh, we went across on the landing craft infantry, you know, where the front drops down, and. And even when we landed, some, still some of the pilots of the boats were scared to bring the boats in, so some of us jumped in over our heads sometimes. And with that full 50, 60, 70 pound pack, guys that couldn't swim were in bad luck. Some of them didn't make it. But anyway, I, I made it. I got ashore, and we did what we would now see in, a, in the movies, you know, run and jump and hide and roll over. Uh, there was still some sporadic shooting going on a little bit inland, but on the beaches we were pretty safe. And as we came into France, the French people met us very nicely. And as we went in where there was still fighting though, and we would take a town, one of those little French towns, we'd have a color ceremony every night, so I'd get up and blow the bugle and, and have a nice retreat ceremony to, to impress the people. And we uh, partook of their food which they were more than happy to give us because we freed them. They liked it. So that was my initiation into France. Now I'll never forget on Christmas Day, must have been 1944. Yeah, Christmas 1944, I sat on a, it must have been the Maginot line with a one foot in France and one foot in Germany and ate a box of chocolate chip cookies that my sister had sent me. Pleasant memory of Christmas Day, 1944. Then, uh, then of course, from that on, 1944 Christmas until January 16th, 1945, I got shot. And the period in between there was just fighting, battle. And it was cold, miserable, wet. Uh, we would lay down at night in our bedrolls and they'd be wet, but we'd be in them anyway without taking our clothes off. In the morning we'd get up and just do the same thing and day in, in and day out. I think we had as many casualties to trench foot and pneumonia as we did to bullets, but there's a lot of casualties. Of course, me being one of them. Now, of course, talking about uh, January of 1945, we're talking about the Battle of Hurlesheim. Battle of Hurlesheim, yes. And I was, uh, the initial assault, which is a book I wrote along, um, was it 9th or 10th or something like that? Dates I don't remember. But anyway, we went in and we went into the waterworks in Herlesheim and we stayed overnight. Very unpleasant, people shooting at us from every angle. And But we made it out the next day and went back and we regrouped. And the next time we went up was January 16th and uh, I remember we pulled along a road. Again, it was cold, and miserable, snowy. And then the Captain Drass, whose runner I was, said, Chuck, go down the road and find Company B. They're supposed to be up there, but I don't see any sign of them. So I went back down the road, and I had to pass an open field. And as I did, the guys with 88s started to open up on me. And I remembered my good old football days, so I would dive and roll over and dive and roll over. I didn't get hit right then. I had my overcoat on, a field jacket. You know, I must have 
this had weight pull, unbelievable. But I still did what I had to do. But then on the way back, I didn't find Company B, by the way. So I, I returned. And listen, our radios, which we had, either they didn't work. Nothing worked except that's why they needed the runners. And as I recall, the runners get, sh get shot at pretty often. So as I was coming back, all of a sudden one of those lousy shots from the 88 hit me. It hit me in the legs, but it, I couldn't move, and I was bleeding profusely. And I thought, uh, laying there seemed like hours. And one of my friends ran by, he was our, our chief radio man, Sergeant Thompson. And uh, he said, Chuck, I got a go, but I'll make sure somebody comes back for you. And he did take my pack from the back of my belt and put sulfur on the wound and wrap it. And then he left. And I thought I laid there for 80, 89 hours. It was probably a couple hours, you know. And I said, I'm going to die. And then I got to thinking, no, I can't. My mother wouldn't like it. So that was a story. That's a true story, too. So anyway, I didn't die. And sure enough, sooner or later, a tank came by. And those guys jumped off the tank. I don't know where they were from or anything, but uh, put me on a stretcher, loaded me on a tank, took me back to a field hospital. And uh, I'm not sure where that was exactly. But in that tent affair, there was uh, German prisoners were taking care of us as the orderlies and stuff. And um, young surgeons there in those days, they were to try to save lives. They were doing a lot of cutting. But I may have been a young kid, but I was smart enough to say, no, sir, you're not cutting my leg off. And they honored my request. I'm, I don't know why, but they did. So they eventually sent me back to a, a evacuation hospital, Marseille or Nancy, I'm not sure which. But then they loaded me on the hospital ship SS Acadia. We got milk, clean sheets, ice cream. It was wonderful. And the uh, cute young nurses, and they brought me books to read. I never forget, I read The Robe and The Cardinal. Those are two I remember. But uh, the, the nurses and the doctors and orders were just wonderful to us. And of course the food was unbelievable and it was warm. And then we took the trip across the ocean. This is still in January, mind you. So the fighting still going on behind me, but it was over for me. So they landed at South Carolina, Stark General Hospital, where the, all they did was sort us out and send us on to different hospitals. Me, they sent to Billings General Hospital in Indianapolis, Indiana, where we were put on 16 20-man wards, and uh, they did everything they could to make my leg get better, and had several surgeries, and I was in a cast, either a full hip cast, or for about six months there. <coughs> I spent almost a year at that hospital in Indianapolis. By the end though, we were getting out, we were having real wheelchair races in the halls and we, we were taken to the nicest places in town and it was, it was getting quite social. But while I was in that hospital, World War II ended and they shut that hospital down so tight that we the boys in there could not get a drink, we couldn't celebrate anything. They just locked us in, I don't know why, but they did. And then uh, they said, well, what you need now is more rehab. So they transferred me up to Percy Jones General Hospital in Battle Creek, Michigan. And you no, know, first of all, they transferred me to Fort Custer, Michigan, which was a kind of almost deserted army camp, but it was turned into a, a rehab center for wounded soldiers. And I did physical therapy and they sent you to school and like they had a music school, I could pull up my trombone and, and play, which, which by the way, one of the nicest memories I have of Texas College of Mines and Metallurgy was that I got to play in the band there and I played a trombone and I got to stand up at an assembly and play Tommy Dorsey's getting sentimental over you. That was quite a thrill, you know, because I'm not Tommy Dorsey. But uh, back to reality, we're back now in this Fort Custer and uh, doing rehab. And finally they said, well, we should probably discharge you now. And I said, no, sir. I'm from Chicago. I got to ride streetcars. I got to ride buses. My leg would not bend. It was straight as a whip. They said, okay, we'll send you into town, into the hospital, see what they can do for you. 
in the town, a young surgeon, I don't remember his name, but he was a new orthopod, and he said, I think I can try something on there that may fix you. So he tried what they call the quadriceps plasty, which spread the cords above your knee over, and hey, he got me 90 degrees knee bend, which was just like heavens. So I had avoided getting the leg cut off, and then I avoided getting it left straight. So I had accomplished a few things there. And uh, at Percy Jones, they took us to Detroit, to the ball games and the football games. And uh, he had bands come in, Stan Kenton, Alvino Ray, Carmen Caballero, all the big bands came in to entertain us. It was quite wonderful. And we had softball games right around us. I couldn't play, but I could watch. And <coughs> the, the big shot bowlers from Detroit came in to teach us to try to bowl again. So I got to bowl with some of the big bowlers, and that was interesting in that life. And I would take uh, weekend passes into Chicago, hometown, and until the time, then about June 2nd, 1947, about two and a half years in the hospital, about June 2nd they decided they had enough of me. So, so they discharged me, and I went back to Des Plaines, Illinois, which was my home. And, uh, oh, I took a summer job working at the post office sorting mail. And, uh, but I knew I was going to college, so I did. I went back to the University of Colorado and uh, got my degree. And then I came back to Chicago and got a job, met my wife-to-be, got married and lived happily ever after. Wow. It's a great ending to the story.